Have you ever loved someone? Not the selfish, watered-down, nonsense, Hollywood and Disney world try and convince us love is. Have you ever really loved someone? Of course you have. We all have families. We all have friends. They might drive us crazy. They may be dysfunctional at times. But we love them. Because that's what real love is. It's not conditional. It's not about us. It's wanting the best for the other person. It is seeking their good, even if there is a cost to us. I'm very fortunate to have a close-knit family. I'm also fortunate to have friends that I've known for 27 plus years. It's a beautiful, chaotic burden. Families are complicated and everyone has their own drama. Mine is no different. But when it comes down to it, my family will always be there for me. I would do anything for my family, something my mom installed in, in us from young, you never turn your back on family. She lived it out in the time I had with her. She would always do her best to help family, whether they were on good terms or not. Because family is a gift from God. No one has a perfect family. No one. I love my family and I know they love me too. I've been around long enough to experience it. My friends I have grown up with, those who knew me when I still had hair, are no different. The greatest blessing my family and friends have been to me is that they're very real with me. They tell me the truth, even if it's hard. That's what real love is. It's sacrificing how hard something might be for us. It's knowing this will hurt you and your relationship for a while, but saying that you'll do it anyway, because your loved one and their best is more important. When you really love someone, you don't care about the cost to yourself or how hard it will be or the awkwardness, because you know it will make their life better. We all know what it is to love someone and to really love them. And because we all know what it is like, we all know what the hardest part of love is. The hardest part of loving someone is that you can't make them do the best thing for them. You can't make the decisions for them. You can't make them see that it will be the best for them. You can only have your say. You can only show them. But they have to want it. When you love someone, when you see their beauty slowly fading, when you know what they are doing is hurting them, that's really hard. That hurts. For me, that's the hardest truth to deal with. I can't protect my amazing auntie or my caring cousin or my fantastic friend from themselves. It's one thing when someone else hurts them. But when they're choosing it for themselves, that's the most heartbreaking. Have you ever felt that pain? I know you have. And I know you do. And tonight, we're going to feel that pain. As we look at the truth of God's word, we'll be confronted with a truth that we don't really like to think about. A truth we prefer wasn't there. A truth that says some will be saved and others won't. Or to put it another way, some are chosen and others aren't. Is God really in control? Why wouldn't he love my family and friends and choose them? It is hard to grapple with as a Christian, especially because we know how loved we are. We know God is love. And so we respond in two extremes. We either ignore it, it's too hard to think about, and so we gloss over it. We don't deny it's there, but we, we don't ever engage with it. On the other extreme, we try and explain it away. We seek to justify it by adding things to it. Let's ask God to help us here tonight as we come to his word and make sure we don't do either of these things. Heavenly Father, you are in control. You are a great big God. And this is a difficult topic. So please be with us tonight. Help us to hear your truth, to see your truth, to be challenged and encouraged by it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's listen to verse 1 to 3 again. As we do, hear Paul's emotion and love for his fellow Israelites. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers and sisters, my kinsmen according to the flesh. You can feel the full weight of Paul's seriousness here. What he's going to unpack in these next three chapters weighs heavy on his heart. It's not something to gloss over or ignore 
the complexities of these truths. Paul has great sorrow and unceasing anguish in his heart, and he's not being a drama queen. Uh, if you've seen a loved one go down a deep hole of addiction or struggle with mental health, you'll know some of the pain that Paul's feeling. Paul's brothers and sisters are facing eternal suffering and separation from God. He's so pained that he has the response that we have. He wishes that he could trade places with his brothers and sisters. The previous chapter of Romans ends with these words. 8.37-39 to says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8 is a massive high point in Paul's letter. These words are incredible. They are huge. They are great comfort. Nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. But Paul now gets to a major point of his letter to the Romans. Romans 1 to 8 has been boarding up to this section in Romans 9 to 11. Paul has been, and continues to anticipate the questions of the churches as they read this letter aloud. If nothing can separate us from God's love, especially the God's love in Christ, well, what about Israel? Many Israelites have not repented. Many Israelites continue to reject the risen Christ. Is God really in control? Does he really keep his promises? Paul recognizes this pain and he's completely aware of what seems to be a contradiction in God's word. I mean, Israel had it all, didn't they? Now, we're not going to read it again, but if you have time, look at the, <clears throat> the text of Romans 9, 4-5 and see all the privilege that Israel have. Above all peoples and nations, no one can say Israel never had a chance. They were by far the most privileged people in the entire, entire creation. It's just like... <clears throat> Jeff Bezos' elder son, Preston, a son of a billionaire, he's lacking nothing. Uh, sure, his parents might try and teach him uh, to value things, but let's be honest, he will always have the best of everything. It's like comparing him with us. There's no doubt in terms of physical wealth and things, he is way better off than we could ever dream of or imagine. Israel were the Preston Bezos of the world. Not only did they have incredible physical possessions and power, they had the inside scoop to his salvation and eternity. I mean, come on, you can't get better than that. And the kicker in this list of privilege is that the Christ, who is God over all, was from their race according to the flesh. What? God chose to be a human. It was all part of his plan, and he chose to be an Israelite. Jesus, God the Son, is an Israelite. And yet, as Paul looks around, as we look around today, they don't accept Jesus the Christ. Jesus is not their Messiah. They have rejected all their privilege. They have rejected their God. Imagine Preston Bezos saying he does, just wants to disown his family and reject his privilege. <laughs> no ways. Israel had the inside scoop of God's eternal kingdom, and yet they reject it. This is crazy. And Paul anticipates this, so here are his words in 9 verse 6. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. How could Israel fail after having the greatest start out of the whole world? Well, maybe they didn't. Maybe it's God, God's word that failed. Maybe God is not really in control of all things. That might be the conclusion that we have. But Paul quickly shuts that down. The truth is that God's word has not failed. God is really in control. How do we know that? Well, Paul unpacks it for us. Let's read the rest of uh, chapter 9, verse 6. But before we do, let's just imagine that you're an Israelite. Imagine you are sitting in this church in Rome as this letter from Paul is written. And take a moment... Okay, are you there? Okay, now, listen to these words from chapter 9, verse 6. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. <laughs> Wait, what? How does that work? Well, the answer is in God's word. Paul uses God's word to show us this is not something he made up or something new. God was very clear from the beginning who his people are. In our case, who Israel are. He starts with Isaac. Isaac is the son God promised to Abram. He is the one God chose for the nation of Israel to come from. Abram had another son from his wife's slave, Hagar. His name was Ishmael. Although he received the blessing from God, he was not the son of the promise. He was the son of works. Abram and Sarah, remember, they were freck old. Think of your grandparents coming to you and saying, Great news, we're having a baby. Omar is pregnant. That, 
is weird and pretty much impossible. What makes it even harder is that Sarah has never, ever had children before. She's barren. Abraham and Sarah knew this. The world around them knew this. So they came up with their own plan to fulfill God's promises. Sarah had a young slave girl who wouldn't have any issues giving birth. And so Sarah said to her husband, go and sleep with her. Then you can take her child as the child of the promise. But God didn't say that. God didn't promise that. He promised the impossible. So years later, Opa Abraham and Oma Sarah had a child of their own. His name was Isaac. True Israel are children of the promise, not children of the flesh. Another example are Isaac's sons, <clears throat> Jacob and Esau. They were twins. Esau was the oldest and the greater one who would naturally get the inheritance. You would assume the promise would flow through him. But before they were even born, God chose Jacob as the son of the promise. Before they lived to do right or wrong. There's a physical line through the flesh, but God is more concerned about the promise than the physical. Why? Well, let's listen to verse 11 and 12. Though they were not born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. <clears throat> but isn't that unfair? God, how can you choose some and not others? Isn't that injustice on God's part? And that's the very question that Paul anticipates and answers at the end of verse 14. And he says, by no means. How can he say that? Again, we go to God's word, this time Exodus, and we read some of, the, some of that earlier. God's election is not a matter of justice, but a matter of mercy. The example of the bad Pharaoh is given. God will have mercy on who he has mercy and compassion on who he has compassion. God hardens Pharaoh's heart and Pharaoh hardens his own heart. It's a bit of a dance that they seem to take place during, between Pharaoh and God. It's difficult for us to accept as we read because God is love. Remember that this Pharaoh is not some wimp that is helpless or innocent. He is the superpower of the day. Everybody fears him. He is responsible for the slavery of the Israelite nation, intense slavery. He also kills male babies in his wickedness. To understand this better, we must look back at Romans 1, 24 to 25. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So this is the picture we must <clears throat> have in mind when we are here hardening. It's a handing over of people to what they have chosen. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, a famous uh, pastor from Wales uh, and great theologian, uh, he puts it this way. He says, The world fell into sin, but God put a limit, a restraint upon it, and this world would be complete chaos and hell if he did not do so. But the moment he draws back his restraining influence at any point, there is a hardening there. So that is one of the ways in which God produces hardening. He leaves them to themselves. And therefore, election is not unfair or an injustice on God's part. Justice would be saving no one. Mercy is the truth that some are saved. Mercy is receiving something you don't deserve. It's quite literally the opposite of justice. Now, there's lots more to say here, but I can't, but I will say next week as we look at this passage again, and this will be the pattern we'll follow throughout the series. We'll work through a text, get a feel for it, and some grounding, and then come back next week and unpack a topic and dig deeper together. But as we continue, we might still be thinking what Paul assumes his original audience is thinking. Well, if God chose some and not others, if he is fully in control, well, then what's the point? If we have no choice of the outcome, why bother? And Paul responds with these words in chapter 9, verse 20. But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will, the, will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? And it's a great illustration for, uh, for us because it shows us two very important things. Firstly, it proves to us that we definitely have free will. The very fact that we think we can answer back to God should cause us to realize that we have free will. My phone never asks me what's the point of life, never answers me back without me asking it something. And the same with my laptop or any technology I have, because it doesn't have free will. It's a robot or a computer. Even AI is designed to respond in specific ways because it was given those commands. It is forced to think that way. It doesn't feel or understand why. We do because we are made by someone far more intelligent and powerful than we can ever be, which is the point Paul makes as he continues. We are like pieces of clay. 
We are the creatures, we are not the creator. If we think otherwise, well, we miss the point. We rob God of his glory. God is much bigger than us. God is wisdom. God is love. God is eternal. God is all-knowing. God made us. We did not make him. God will always know better than us. But don't forget, God gives everyone a chance to repent. Israel have had every opportunity. Yet they chose to reject him. But the great news is that God calls his people. The people not of flesh, that is direct descent of Abraham, but people of the promise. He has called people from Israel as well as people from the nations, the Gentiles. Many of us here tonight have been called. Chapter 9, verse 25 to 27, Paul quotes some more Old Testament passages to show the glory of God, to show God is fully in control of all things, to show God indeed does keep his promises. Yet it doesn't depend on us at all. It is all God. The challenge for us tonight as we listen to what God is telling us is this. Do we see the need to understand the complexity of God's sovereignty. Sovereignty being that God is over all things, in control. Well, how do we do that? Well, firstly, we need to listen to God and not ourselves or others. Our emotions will deceive us on this truth. Our world will tell us God is unfair and wicked, or that he can't exist if the fact that he chooses some and not others is true. But that means we haven't heard properly. The truth is simple and complicated at the same time. It makes perfect sense for those outside Hitler, the apartheid government, etc. But it doesn't make sense when it's my best friend or my sweet old granny. It's complicated. But secondly, we need to trust God and his character, not ourselves or others. It's not about being good. We all deserve an eternity in hell. God in his mercy saves son, but he gives everyone a fair chance to repent. Unfortunately, like some of our family members or friends who reject our advice or help, people reject God and his word. Therefore, they choose to reject his mercy. God is truth, God is just, God is mercy. We can and must trust him above anyone and everyone else. Thirdly, we do this by marinating in these truths rather than trying to run away from them. It's hard, it's rough. But as we marinate in this, we will grow to understand God's love for his people, for his creation. We will grow to appreciate God's love for his people. We'll get a little window into his heart. And I hope to show you more of this next week. <clears throat> difficult truths often carry the most beauty. And so fourthly, we need to recognize the difficulties of this truth rather than trying to solve them. The truth is here for a reason. God hasn't hidden it from us. So don't be ashamed of it. Don't try and make excuses for God. Don't try and explain it away. Fight the urge to soften it, to come up with a theory. Sometimes when I see my loved ones hurting, I just want to solve it for them. My wife has taught me that it's okay to just let it be. Sometimes you just need to be sad for a little bit. Sometimes you need to feel those emotions. Our world says we should just be happy all the time and move on. And God says it's okay to feel. I made you that way. But don't forget the truth. Fifthly and finally, we should use our free will to give God glory for his wisdom and love. We shouldn't use free will to tell God what he should or shouldn't do. The right response to this beautiful truth is to marvel at God. <clears throat> to give him all the glory. The fact that any of us are saved is incredible. We often like to tell God what he should or shouldn't do instead of appreciating what he's already done. We miss out on the joy and the comfort and love he gives when we get caught up in the things we can't control. For those still not hearing, for those who are choosing to ignore this truth, remember the truth about our hard hearts. You might want to be left alone, but that would be the worst place to be in. As someone who loves you, please hear God tonight. You are surrounded by people who love you. We don't want you to make the worst choice that you could ever make. We don't want you to experience eternal suffering and pain. It would break our hearts. If you have heard the truth tonight, we all have. We all need to nestle in God rather than wrestle with God. So is God really in control? Yes, he is. Praise his name. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are such a great big God. You have made salvation possible. For some or other reason, you have chosen to show mercy on our world. And thank you for that. Thank you for saving, saving us, for calling us to yourself. And we do continue to pray for those who, who refuse to hear and refuse to see, or who have heard and seen but choose to reject it. Please will you soften their hearts. Please will you open their ears and eyes to you.
Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.